and welcome to another edition of Transformational Astrology. I'm Henry Seltzer. And we have an important event to discuss today because, as I'm sure about 98.5% of you know, this is an eclipse uh, coming up tomorrow, the second in a series of July eclipses that we've been talking about in the astrological community and in the Facebook posts and everything. And uh, this particular um, full moon eclipse or lunar eclipse that's happening uh, tomorrow at 2.38 p.m. Pacific time, it would be, I guess, 5.38 uh, East Coast time, and then even later than that in the evening for Europe. This eclipse that's coming up is actually quite powerful, and it's powerful in ways that are, I think, very interesting, um, speaking of the societal changes that are ahead of us. So um, I gave a talk recently, and somebody was uh, coaching me before speaking and said, you know, talk about what's happening for individuals. Don't talk about what's happening for the whole of humanity, they said. And I, I didn't question it at the time because I was just, just about to go live with everything. But um, I thought about that later, and I was thinking that actually, you know, in a way, though, they are really very, very much the same thing because I think what humanity is going through at this time is, is quite uh, a factor for what individuals are going through and vice versa. And if you think about it, the way the society is changing, which is something that we astrologers are talking about quite a bit, um, coming into these climactic years of 2019 and 2020. So we're talking about how society is changing and how there's big you know, transformation of the whole social order with Pluto and Saturn so close together and so important uh, archetypally right now. And what does that mean? Well, that is made up of individuals. That is <laughs> the individual choices of great masses of people in aggregate. So really, you have a part in what's happening with the society. And I think that's something that's very interesting to consider. As we get ready to switch over, um, we're going to be taking a look at the chart itself of this full moon eclipse. And uh, I'm giving a little time for people to catch up and, and log in in case they're uh, trying to connect up. And I want to start before everybody's ready. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to be doing is bringing up the chart. We're going to be talking about how it hits the Pluto-Saturn conjunction, uh, which is no longer a precise conjunction anymore, but it is uh, still a very close parallel. And I'll show you that too. So I guess we'll get to it and bring the chart up. Let me get, get that going now. Okay. Now you should be able to see the full moon chart on your screen. And this is a natural chart, that is to say uh, we're putting Aries on the horizon line because um, we don't know what time it is where you are and we want to be uh, talking about not the chart with what's rising on the west coast which would be actually Scorpio rising. That's, this is the rising sign, the notation for the rising. Uh, but, you know, by putting it Aries, Taurus, Gemini, we are seeing what's called a natural chart. We're seeing the way the, um, the houses uh, and, the, and the signs interact in a certain way. We're, we, if we say something's happening in Aries, it's also happening in the first house. That's true for the bulk of, of people, the, the, way, um, the way things uh, line up. Uh, it is still talking about that kind of uh, initiative and push that that's, uh, corresponds to Aries and also to the first house if you're talking about an individual chart. So that again brings up the uh, idea of the individual versus the collective that we were just speaking of. So let's take a look at the way this, this uh, full moon lines up. And of course the sun and moon are opposite. The degree is 24. We have the sun at 24 degrees of Cancer. We have the moon at 24 degrees of Capricorn. Um, you might also notice, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we have other objects in this chart at the 24 degree mark of cardinal signs, we have Eris at 24 degrees of Aries, and we have opposite Eris, this new planet Haumea, which is uh, also named as an official planet by the IAU when they said Pluto's a dwarf planet now. These Kuiper Belt objects are called dwarf planets. And the other one is Eris, which is arguably the more dramatic and the larger uh, in appearance and also in density of the two. And then uh, the other two that were named at the same time as dwarf planets are Haumea and Makimaki. And those are represented, those are located in Libra right now, and they're represented 
by these symbols. One is looks slightly like a birdman, and it is the culture of the birdman, um, Rapa Nui culture of Easter Island. And then also, um, this is Haumea, it was supposed to represent to some extent a pregnant lady, and it's also uh, a glyph that is similar to the Pluto glyph. Both of these are variations of the Pluto glyph because these are actually called Plutoids. They're very close in orbital. Uh, the, the period of years of uh, their orbit is uh, very similar to Pluto, a little bit more than Pluto. Uh, 295 in the case of Haumea and 310 for Makimaki. So anyway, um, we'll be talking about that in a minute, but it is just interesting to note that they make a grand cross at exactly 24 degrees, a partile grand cross in this configuration. I think that's very significant, bringing more power yet to this eclipse configuration, which is after all a very powerful full moon. That's why we get so excited about eclipses because they represent not just a full moon, which happens every month, uh, the, the astrology of every month is significant. The new moon is always significant where it lands, uh, how it lines up with your chart. Uh, you know, people are always saying, well, how does the eclipse affect me? What is it going to do to me when it hits my chart in a certain way? What is that about? That's true of every new moon, if you think about it. A new moon on your uh, Mercury degree is going to be a, a new impulse to uh, be articulate in a certain way, to go to depth in what you're talking about, to maybe start writing about it. Uh, and that's true every month. Uh, the eclipse, of course, um, is a longer lasting configuration. We say that eclipses, because they're more powerful, lunations do have a, a lasting time of up to six months where they might have, a, have an effect or you might feel it. You might feel it on your, on your planet. So if you do have an eclipse right on your, your sun degree, <clears throat> for example, or another degree, uh, another planet in your chart, then you, you are going to feel it for quite a while. And it is a rebirth of that particular energy. So really the recipe is to take a look at what is going on with that particular planet and to try to understand it in new ways. Uh, we're doing that all the time. We're always learn looking at our charts, learning more about our charts each time because it's a complex subject as is uh, human nature and the human psyche in general. So let's take a look at the particulars of, of this eclipse and the way um, it lines up <clears throat> with the other planets in the sky right now. And of course, the thing that's striking is that uh, the moon is so close to Pluto, it's only a few degrees away. We're talking about two and, two and a bit of degrees here. Um, so we're talking about um, how the eclipse uh, really uh, highlights Pluto as a factor, and if Pluto was not already highlighted, we say, well, this could be a time of great transformation, a time of great change, especially if it hits a personal planet in your chart. But the fact of the matter is, it's even more so, is even stronger than that, because Pluto and Saturn are very closely aligned with the uh, south node of the, of the moon between them, and also they're parallel to each other and to the nodal axis. So uh, Saturn, if we right click on it in the Time Passages software, you can easily see that not only <laughs> is Saturn uh, in a close parallel with Pluto, here's the P and the, here's the Pluto symbol, and this is 22.1 or 22 degrees in a few minutes of a degree. Pluto, if we look, is at 22.1 also. In fact, it's the same degree in the same minutes of a degree. So to the minute, these two planets are in parallel with each other, which is a form of conjunction. So even though they're not any more in close conjunction in the sky, being about five degrees apart here, they are, in fact, in very close uh, parallel to each other. In other words, it's kind of a conjunction. So we do have Saturn and Pluto, and we can see the evidence all around us because Saturn and Pluto together is a contractive situation. It's a time of stress. It's a time of difficulty. It's a time, uh, Rick Tarnas says in Cosmos and Psyche, he, he talks about Saturn-Pluto. That's one of the chapters in his book on outer planet combinations. He talks about Uranus-Pluto, which was the 60s, and now also with the opening square. But he's also talking about Saturn-Pluto in that book, and he has a whole chapter on it, including the times of uh, World War II, when there was another conjunction. That was a conjunction that took place in the 40s. The, the conjunction that we're working on now, that we're just winding up, took place in 1981, and that was the Reagan years. And that was also uh, a lot of times of kind of dire consequences in Central America, which we're still seeing the results of today. Uh, because that Central American uh, policy of uh, 
kind of squelching any any socialist governments in, for example, Nicaragua, at the time, uh, has has led to uh, definitely um, some very difficult situations in Guatemala and Nicaragua for the people living there, partly because of the U.S. Uh, influence to to keep it. Um, and a certain attitude that was uh, working with the United States rather than working for their own people so much. So that is, uh, we we're still, I'm getting a little political here, but we're still suffering from that today, or they are, and we're seeing the results when there's uh, the people uh, fleeing from Central America or coming to the southern border, and you know that situation, which is rather difficult right now, very difficult. So uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to ramble quite so much there. But uh, basically, um, Saturn and Pluto in combination have a, a kind of a dire consequence to them. And the, the exact conjunction, by the way, of Saturn and Pluto is not right now. The conjunction in terms of zodiacal longitude does not happen until January of 2020. And then the further news, and I think m many of you already know this, certainly astrologers have been talking about it, is that towards the end of 2020, um, they are still in close alignment to each other. Saturn moves ahead and then moves back and comes back close to Pluto again. And then at that point also Jupiter joins. So we have a triple conjunction. And Jupiter and Saturn together have to do with societal events. And there's a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction on December 21st of 2020, which is for the first time in a long time in air signs. So this is very significant. But not only that, um, the triple conjunction, including Saturn and including Jupiter, you see, um, that does refer directly to the transformation of society. So we're seeing a big watershed time in our whole society, and this whole 21st century has been uh, kind of gearing up for that, although 2001 was probably the first instance of Saturn and Pluto coming in. Saturn and Pluto were exactly opposite. Uh, in September 20, 2001, when 9-11 took place, and that was across the axis of the United States chart, the ascendant and the descendant of the United States chart. So that's very interesting as well, and we can be looking, we want to be looking at the United States chart. Uh, I want to show uh, the transits for that and, and give, the, give us some food for thought there as to how this is affecting the whole uh, national consciousness right now. So Saturn-Pluto, um, triggered by this eclipse, um, Saturn also um, in a semi-sextile to Jupiter, and there's a parallel. Jupiter is also at 22, 2208. So these are all <laughs> very close together. Um, eight minutes versus three minutes. So Jupiter's in this act as well, along with Saturn and Pluto. And then the Sun degree is, is close too. The Sun degree, 21.3. So uh, this is all, um, th that's within a degree in other words. So this is all very, um, exciting configuration that's powerful. And uh, <clears throat> we can see in addition that opposite Saturn, which is the other part of this conjunction, is Venus at 16 degrees of Cancer, right opposite the 16 degree partile opposition to Saturn. So, uh, th th which brings a lot of energy to the situation because, you know, you can think of Venus also as being the ruler of Libra, Libra being one of the cardinal signs that's in a square configuration, a grand cross configuration with the cardinal eclipse that we have here between Cancer and Capricorn. So it's very powerful. Um, what does it all mean? Um, and, and you can even bring Neptune into it because there is the square between Jupiter and Neptune right now. Uh, so that is also triggered, and that was triggered more closely at the, in the timing of the original uh, July 2nd eclipse because uh, these two planets were also uh, in an angle uh, sesquiquadrate arrangement with, uh, with Mercury and, and, and Mars at that time. So that, that's been a big factor, the, the, the Jupiter and Neptune. I didn't want to leave Jupiter and Neptune out of this because I think that's very powerful. That's a spiritual impulse, which is a factor in all of this because as we deal with the difficulties and the um, actual um, spiritual evolution of our times, we're also, if we look at it right, we're taking it in the big picture viewpoint and we're taking it to a higher level and that's where Neptune gets involved, that we can step back from this and look at it in terms of the evolution of the species. We can look at it in terms of, um, you know, there's other factors besides the factor of uh, just our daily lives and how we manage our daily lives. As we all know, that's only a part of the story, the other part of the story being 
that we are spiritual beings, that we have souls that go on beyond death, that we um, are here to learn and we're here to try to grow ourselves individually and the species as a whole. And like I said before, every action that we take is part of the greater whole. And the individual actions of individuals is what makes up the societal evolution that we're faced with. Look at how one person can change things when these rampages take place. You know, somebody uh, decides that they are, are violently upset and they need to kill and they start shooting. That affects our whole society. That's the society we live in now, that there's a lot of that going on. A lot of dire calamity in one way or another that we're facing. A lot of divisiveness, um, racial hatreds coming out in the open. Um, so those are all things that we need to be aware of and we need to face up to and not try to brush it away and, and not look at it. It's something we need to look at. It's a collective wound in our civilization right now. That's something we have to face up to and maybe move beyond. Maybe there's a way we can come together. Maybe there's a way, as the progressives are trying to advance, that we can have a, a more just society, a more equal uh, opportunity society, uh, the income inequality that's been getting more and more extreme in recent years, which also happened at the beginning of uh, the last cycle, the cycle that we're just ending now of Saturn and Pluto. In 81, when the Republicans came in, they talked about trickle-down economics, and that was their way of saying, if we give all the money to the people at the top, some of it will trickle down and there'll be uh, improvement in the economy. Of course, the reverse is actually the case. If you give the money to the people that are in uh, just making their way through the society at lower levels of income, then they spend it because they, they want to have more goods and services. And that creates the actual economic benefit, which we have been seeing in certain uh, ways. But, uh, you know, it's, it's too much gathered at the top right now. It's a dangerous situation. So I'm being very political here. I apologize. I know some people don't like me to get too political when I talk about astrology and what's going on, but it's really all part of the same evolution that we all face, that we have to face up to, um, you know, there's certain things that are not okay, in, including um, cruelty to children, not okay. And so uh, I just have to s stand up for that and make a statement about it. So <clears throat> before we get to the U.S. chart, I'd like to make a statement a little bit more about what's going on in this Grand Cross. So. What is the nature of this new planet, Haumea? It's right opposite Eris, and those are making a perfect square to, to the sun and moon. It's a very powerful configuration. I'd like to speak to that for a minute. So I've, I've been able to determine uh, quite a bit about Eris, as you all know. I've been researching Eris. I think most of you know about this. You've been following me for a while. Um, Eris is a feminine warrior energy for standing up for what you most deeply believe that you can't not do. No, you cannot not do. Uh, what, is, what is your deepest value? Uh, I call it soul intention because it is deep, just like Pluto is deep. So we're coming to a place of recognition that each individual matters, that the individual that has uh, a deep sense of what needs to happen in terms of social justice and acts upon it is acting out this impulse of the spiritual warrior that has to come forward, that has to make themselves heard that has to make a difference. And you see this in all the paradigm shifters that I could find in history, as well as I couldn't find a feminist leader without a strong Eris in their chart. Gloria Steinem has the conjunction, for example. Um, so that's pretty well understood, I think, the, the Eris being um, a feminine warrior energy that really is for standing up for what you most deeply believe. Having that in this <clears throat> eclipse configuration just reminds me that we're all actors in this drama. We're all here to do our part and to put our shoulder to the wheel in whatever way we can find to do it, in whatever we most deeply believe, whatever that might be. This is your chance to act. This is your time. It is time to be part of the cycle of history and to bring forward and do what you can do. And then you feel okay. You know, it may be that you could do only a little as one individual and you could only make a change that's small but it's a change in the direction that you believe in, and that's enough. You're actually empowered in that way. You're not a victim of these mindless, you know, faceless forces that are just moving things one way or another. You're taking part. So it's a road to life, I think, to take part and to act upon what you most deeply believe. 
Well, seeing it with Haumea is very interesting because Haumea seems to represent earth issues. So, <laughs> for example, when Haumea was part of the new moon back in, I think it was, um, it was earlier this year, if I'm right. No, it was last year. When the volcano erupted in Hawaii, ha Haumea was very involved in the new moon configuration. So that was interesting. And we're seeing now, um, I think we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest in the whole climate change situation, which has been kind of hovering in the background of uh, the society's uh, awareness for some time now. And it's all coming out because we're getting so close to a uh, climactic situation with the uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the global warming. Um, everybody knows that it's kind of headed for a couple of degrees, which means possibly a four foot rise in, in sea level at the very least. And the more we delay, the worse that gets. And also the extreme weather patterns that we've been seeing worldwide the last few years. We're seeing also the hottest years on record uh, several years in a row now. So it's real and it's happening and um, it's kind of silly for some forces within the society to say it's not happening. <laughs> it's kind of like head in the sand, ostrich to put their head in the sand and hope that the problem will go away, it won't go away. So we all have to pull together and the great news is that um, we are in a situation as a human race and as m multiple countries in the world where we all have to pull together by George and here we are in this eclipse time and I think it is a time when the recognition of that global warming uh, climate change situation coming down upon us will be more and more uh, part of the zeitgeist, more and more part of the conversation, and it just becomes almost irrelevant to talk about some of these other factors when we're, we're faced with a situation where we all have to pull together, we have to do some kind of Manhattan Project to find a way to reduce global warming and various, uh, various things that can be done, including um, well, the agriculture is another big factor in all that. But there's a book, <clears throat> by the way, on, on this uh, called Drawdown, which is uh, Paul Hawkins' book. And uh, he's assembled a huge team of people to indicate what could be done. And there's a hundred solutions in there, not that each one is a perfect solution, but each one contributes. So if something is done in this way and in that way and another way and another way, it can begin to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, begin to possibly... Uh, save the complete melting of the of the polar ice caps and maybe maybe sea level rise won't be completely unstoppable up to 10 they say up to maybe up to i think as high as as 10 10 yeah. meters uh if everything melts so anyway <clears throat> enough about that um but i do think that it's very significant that uh, how May is involved in this configuration, as I was trying to indicate. Now, I think it might be good to look at the U.S. chart and see how that relates. And we have here the transits for the eclipse. And what we have is um, we do have um, 24 degrees of Cancer is in this U.S. chart. It's the Mercury degree. So Mercury in the U.S. chart represents the media, and it represents the national conversation. So this is, again, <laughs> one more indication that the climate change is going to be coming up even more so, um, I believe, in this conversation because it does involve these other two planets as well, uh, Eris opposite Haumea. And then we might think about also the fact that the Saturn in the U.S. chart, which means the executive, is um, in the 10th, which is, means we have a strong executive in this country, as we do. It's a very powerful position. And that is a, a cardinal sign of Libra, and it's at 14 degrees, 48 minutes. So this eclipse, uh, it's not so much the eclipse degree that's hitting that Saturn, but it is the Saturn position, uh, which is squaring that Saturn position. So this is a time of testing for the executive branch of the country. And that is really coming into um, prominence. And we see also the Saturn sun square in the US chart, we, when we have Saturn at 14 degrees of Libra, we have the Sun in the U.S. chart at 13 degrees of Cancer. This is the chart for 1776, the Declaration of Independence that we still celebrate at our national holiday, July 4th, 1776. The time comes from a, a local astrologer at the time who said it was 5, uh, 10 p.m. is what he said, and we, we have 5.13 p.m. here, and 55 seconds, 5 uh, p.m., 13 minutes and 55 seconds, because this chart was rectified by Jane Rudyard 
uh, to be the real chart according to him, and I just use it because I have so much respect for him as an astrologer, humanist astrologer of the past century. So it does uh, hit this chart very strongly because of the Saturn Sun square uh, and the Saturn position, which is opposite the Sun degree and square to the Saturn degree in the US chart. I'm sure there's other factors in this chart as well that we might want to look at. One thing that we want to think about is the fact that Pluto in the US chart is in Capricorn. Uh, Pluto in the sky is at 21 degrees now. Uh, it will be around 23 when they all three have that triple conjunction next year in November of 2020, which is getting close to, this, to the Pluto degree. The, the Pluto return of the United States chart being around 250 years old, the United States. So um, that is very significant. And also the fact that Pluto is in the second house of the US chart, uh, that is kind of a compulsion about finances and money, which you can see in the national character. Um, in fact, that's the rule of wealth is called plutocracy <laughs> by chance, as it turns out, not related to the planet Pluto. So anyway, um, we do see that there, there's an issue with income inequality right now, which I think is important to address. And I think that's mostly what I wanted to say about this. Um, Mars in the US chart is also involved in this, being at 21 degrees, also close to the 24 degree mark. Um, it's not quite as strong, though, because it's not in the cardinal position. It's, it's not a square, in other words, or an opposition. It's, um, a semi-sextile between the Sun and a inconjunct from the Moon to this uh, Mars position. But it is something to think about, that there is a militancy in the United States in the way it deals with other people, which is also a generosity. You have, you have Jupiter and, and Venus together in the seventh house, which is the way we, as a country, relate to other countries. And you have Mars as well. So there's a military factor there, police of the world, and there's also a generosity factor there, all the uh, foreign aid that we that we do generate and the, the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II where we re helped to rebuild Europe and so, so forth. So it's all very fascinating um, and <laughs> I think I'm rambling a little bit here. Why don't we take questions because I think I'm, I'm mostly done with what I wanted to say. So we got some questions? We do have questions. Hello everyone. Leslie Benson. Thanks for joining us today. And our first question is from <clears throat> Norma. And she asks, what influence does this eclipse have on a Cancer sun at 24 degrees? Wow. And just to note, we have a few different people here with us today who have had questions that have the eclipse either right on their sun or right on their moon or right on their ascendant. So. Well, good time to ask that question, definitely. Um, yeah, so anytime a new moon, as I was saying before, hits your chart or full moon, or an eclipse even more so, um, it is a significant event. You don't want to overlook that. With the sun, you know, that's the most important planet in your chart. That is... Um, to some extent, your identity, how you're uh, acting out your soul purpose in this lifetime, to some extent, comes through the sun. We all talk about what's your sun sign. I can tell you, I could tell you were Sag. You know? <laughs> and um, so basically, that does mean a rebirth. Um, now, the fact that it's this full moon, it's also a, an interesting kind of rebirth. It's not like a brand new cycle. It's a way of capitalizing on previous um, development. So there's a way that you're hitting a fulfillment in what you've been up to. And it may be subtle and it may be hard to figure out. It may be that it'll be a year from now you'll look back on and say, oh, that's what that was all about. Because uh, it's hard to figure it out sometimes what the transition is that you're happening. You know, we, we all have had the experience of thinking we wanted something and then we didn't get it. <laughs> and then we get cranky about that. You know, I wanted this. You know, I wanted that promotion. And now that I didn't get it, I think I might even leave. And then we say, you know, two, five, ten years later, we say, oh, my God, that was the best thing I ever did, leaving that situation. That was not good for me. So, you know, there's, there's ways that we don't know what's happening at the time that it's happening, and that's important to recognize. So the thing to do is to be as aware as possible, to be tuned in as, as you possibly can to what's going on inside you, and to be... Um, you know, just alert for whatever messages you can get, because we're getting messages all the time. 
you know, we're, we're always being nudged in certain directions and we're getting signs and, and portents if we pay attention. And what is the purpose of it? The purpose of that is really that we make our own spiritual evolution. That's what it's all about. You know, what do we want uh, when we hit the end of the road? What do we want to put on our gravestone? You know, is it I made, you know, my high point was 160000 That was my yearly salary and what a great salary that was. I don't think so. You know, it's going to be more like um, what your relationship was with your, your loved ones, um, how you took care of things to whatever extent you could, how you came through difficulties, um, how you inspired others, how you somehow managed to help this societal evolution that we're in the midst of. So that's what to tune into and to see how your life right now is aiming, and it's a good time also for introspection, isn't it? Because Mercury's retrograde, we didn't even talk about that, but Mercury's been retrograde since the 7th of July. It doesn't turn direct until the 31st. Um, and even after that, you know, it takes a while to straighten out. So we, we feel like this whole summer, or at least till the beginning, till the middle part, part of August, is a, a time of real uh, introspection and reflection on where life is taking us. And it's perfect to have this intensity of this eclipse and you may be feeling it in various ways. It may be you're hitting a crisis of some kind. And the question, again, is not what is this crisis doing to me? How am I a victim? But it's more what is this crisis um, manifesting in me? How can I come through it in the way that is um, the, the most, the most, uh, the, the, best, uh, <laughs> the best version of myself that I can muster? To deal with this and and what is the meaning uh, in terms of uh, big picture ideas for what I really want to become, what I'm really up to. So that's what my advice is there to keep keep really looking at everything going on and when difficulties arise, try to see the positive side of it. Try to see how you're growing through it. Try to see how it may be serving you to um, have something come to an end that was not in your best interest really in the long run, even though it might be painful. So there is a painfulness involved with transformation. You can't change without. And the pain actually pulls us through. It's sometimes the only thing driving us to the evolutionary uh, situation that we need to really embrace. So I guess that's what I'd say about that. What, we got another one? Yep, we sure do. Okay. This next one is from Arginia. She says, hello from New Zealand. Oh, wow. I'm really curious to know what effect this eclipse will have when conjunct a personal planet, especially considering the Pluto-Saturn south node dance that's already underway. Well, absolutely, and that's what we've been talking about this whole time, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> you know, the fact of the matter is, um, Pluto with Saturn means structural change, dramatic, uh, major uh, structural change, and that could apply to your own life as well, so it may be, and uh, then again, you'd want to look at which personal planet was involved. So. I'm kind of repeating the answer to the previous question that it is time to really t take a look at that the way that planet functions in your life. If it's on your moon, take a look at how your mother was with you. Take a look at how that's carried through to the way you are today, especially if you're a woman where your mother might be the role model that you look up to. Um, take a look at your own nurturing behavior. Take a look at your own emotional um, self. Do you express your emotions? Do you repress your emotions? Um, do you uh, feel sometimes like you're a small child and you don't have any power, uh, like uh, the moon child within? Um, you know, look at those things and look at how the moon, you know, read up on how, how that moon sign, the moon in the sign and, and the moon in the house, and how that, um, what's the manifestation that you can see in your past, and how can you take that forward in a, in a way that's the most beneficial? So. Great. Thank you. Mm. Our next question is from Lily, and she asks, where would a Gemini and Sagittarius tie together? Oh, that's cool. Well, Gemini and Sagittarius actually tie together very well. You might think because the signs are opposite with each other that that's a negative indication, but oppositions are different when you look at a natal chart versus when you're looking at opposition between charts because there's a whole different dynamic involved with two people, obviously. And in fact, oppositions are common between two people 
uh, that draws them together because they do have you do have a commonality in that way. You know, the Gemini and the and the Sag are actually not that different from each other. There's a way, just like the yin yang symbol. You know, think of the yin yang symbol with that white area of the yin yang. Uh, with a small black dot in the middle of it, and the black area with a small white dot. And really, um, it's that the seed of one is contained in the other. So that, um, you know, they're both very intellectual signs, for example. So you have a commonality there. You have big picture viewpoint, and you have um, talkative details, you know, with Gemini uh, and curiosity about learning more. So there's learning involved. And so you learn a lot from each other. and you'll probably uh, never stop talking so <laughs> with each other. So that could be a very good thing. Great. Our next question comes from Margaret. And she simply asks, how can we use the current astrology in supportive ways? Supportive what? <laughs> ways. Supportive ways. Oh, in supportive ways. I'm sorry. I thought it was support of, and then I was trying to figure out what ways was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mercury is Mercury is, in retrograde? Mercury's retrograde. <laughs> so um, supportive, yes. Well, good. Yeah, well, again, boy, this is funny how the questions come in and they're, I, can, I, could, I could just answer each one by saying, oh, I've just been talking about that. Um, because that is what I've been trying to convey, that um, there's a way, you know, every time something happens, um, if it's a beneficial thing, if it's a beautiful, wonderful, positive, magical experience, we all take that in and we say, Life is good. Life is magical. We're having such a beautiful time here. And then uh, when things come along that are difficult, uh, that are obviously um, along, along the lines that we didn't expect, or it's something that we weren't re ready to let go of, but we're having to let go of it. So when a child has to let go of a toy and go to bed, you know, in, in one way, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And there's a lot of uh, wailing that goes on. Similarly with, with adults, you know, when, when we get our toys taken away from us or when things don't go the way where our ego thought they should go. But really when you think about it, there's a very good thing involved sometimes in limitation, sometimes in saying no to something. Um, and, you know, your ultimate response might be, what a beautiful world we, we live in that has all these lessons for us. And I believe that uh, if you make a mistake and something terrible happens and you're in a bad situation, if you can learn from it, at least you haven't lost everything in that. In other words, if a terrible thing happens and you, and you don't learn from it, well, that is, that is terrible. But if a terrible thing happens and you can at least learn from it, um, maybe that's a way of so solving the situation, sal salvaging the situation. So I guess that's what I would say. Yes, we can always, it depends on your frame. You know, you can frame things um, in a positive way, uh, no matter what the situation is. And that's an important recognition. Great. The next question we have, let's see. Let's see this one, uh, this comes from Stuart. It says, in order for a lunar eclipse to have an impact on someone, do the sun and moon positions at the time of the eclipse have to be in aspect to any of that person's planets in their natal chart? Please explain. Thank you. Well, it isn't, it isn't always the only way that it would affect your chart. Um, I have been going through quite a bit of uh, times, uh, quite a bit of what I've been saying um, has been about what happens when the eclipse... Uh, Either, either the new moon eclipse like we had on July 2nd or the full moon eclipse that is now at 24 degrees of cardinal signs. Um, how does that hit your chart? Do you have something at 24 degrees or very close to 24 degrees of a cardinal sign? That's what I've been covering pretty much. And that is not the only way that an eclipse will land in your chart. Uh, every time you have a full moon uh, or an eclipse full moon like this one, uh, there's a pair of signs involved and they are opposite signs and those signs are in certain houses of your chart. So you're talking about an axis of your chart. Now, if it should happen to be that your cancer rising, for example, um, unless you're very late cancer rising, it would be in your first house and your seventh house. And that would be the issue of self and other. That would be how you're dealing with those, those things. So basically, whatever the house is that the sun lands in when you have this full moon, 
uh, and this full moon eclipse, of course, um, that's the house to look at. Probably the house of the sun to begin with, and then think about how that connects over. Because all the signs and all the houses uh, have their opposites, and like I was saying before, their opposites reflect back upon each other. Um, there's a seed of the opposite sign in each, in each sign. Um, and you can go into that in great depth and detail as you look at each particular pair of signs. So in Cancer Capricorn, you know, you have basically the nurturing impulse of Cancer and the almost cold and achievement-oriented sign of, of Capricorn, which is saying, don't let the personal considerations get in the way. Don't let your feelings get in the way. Uh, instead, um, surmount the difficulty in the best way that you possibly can. They both have their virtues. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't want to leave our feelings behind, so there's, um, there's room for both and there's room for the dialogue between them. And to see how those hit your whatever house uh, is Capricorn or 24 degrees of Capricorn, whatever the house that occupies in your chart would be the house to check it out and think about how that uh, area of your life is, is being impacted right now. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next question we have comes from Inner Makeup, who's been a longtime fan of ours. Thanks for being here with us. Yeah. And asking about your thoughts on a retrograde Mercury squaring the first degrees of fixed signs independently and or as part of the eclipse. Well, it is different signs, of course. I mean, we've just been talking about, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> We've just been talking about Cancer and Capricorn, <clears throat> that opposition. And we're talking about Leo uh, when we talk about the retrograde of uh, Mercury, which is coming right through the very beginning degrees of Leo. <clears throat> so this is a way different part of your chart. It is still, though, a factor that you want to consider. So if you did have something in the very early degrees of any of the fixed signs of Leo or Scorpio or Taurus, or, or Aquarius, um, <clears throat> you would be talking about um, that Mercury retrograde being in a particular um, strong factor. And so it's more poignant for you. You might be going along saying, gee, this is, this is really a tough Mercury retrograde. I can't believe what I'm going through. And there again, you know, when you're going through difficult things, um, easy to say, uh, but uh, and not so easy to do, but the recipe is to look into the underlying factors to see how it really kind of contributes to your learning curve and how you're coming along in this lifetime as far as your spiritual evolution. Because really, I, I love what Alan Oaken says, you know. He says, we're here to learn how to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, how to evolve spiritually, how to become really um, at peace with ourselves and um, in a, in a higher uh, in a higher place, a higher raise our vibration, get to be higher in a higher vibration, and that is what we're here for. And he says, uh, I, I love the way he puts this. He says it's the only game in town. You know what else is worth doing, right? <laughs> I mean, you do a lot of other things on the way to that. You might construct art. You might construct writing. Uh, you might uh, have uh, relationships with people that are like-minded people in the same mission as you, which is part of your life mission, and, and it connects with the way society, you know, you're always uh, aiding the evolution of society or in, or hindering it, one, one or the other. You're always doing something that affects everybody around you, really, including just in your vibrational level. You're like a hologram, a piece of a hologram. You're affecting everything, whether you know it or not. And just remembering that and to take it all seriously. Don't get too serious. Take it with a sense of humor. But realize that it is um, there's a Wadsworth, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow line, um, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not the goal. Dust thou art, to dust returneth, was never spoken of the soul. And I think that's a good thing to remember, that we're on a many lifetimes mission to uh, be the best person that we can be, to be the best version of ourselves that we can muster. And the retrograde gives you an opportunity to look inside, gives you an opportunity to really try to um, understand where your life is taking you. And again, in the particular uh, house that it's in, in the particular um, connection that it makes to your particular personal planets. So that's the, 
That's the summary of almost everything that I've been saying, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. So at this point, we have a few more questions. Oh, we do? Okay. Most of them are about more about how the eclipse will be affecting birth charts. Um, do you want to answer Well, I think I've those? covered that so well already. Okay. Great. So thoroughly. Um, then let's see. We have one question that's skipping ahead to the upcoming Mercury retrograde in November. Do you want to hmm. look into that right now? Or? That seems a little farther afield. Um, okay. I think probably we, we could wind up, um, unless, you, unless there's another relevant one. Yeah, I think that we answered most of the questions pretty good. So um, let's go back to um, the chart itself. I think we've covered everything. I mean, I didn't mention Chiron, and I didn't mention Uranus. Um, Chiron and Uranus are connected to each other, being exactly 30 degrees apart. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because almost everything I've been saying uh, really relates back to Chiron as well. Chiron is our inner wounding. A lot of times what holds us back is, is the fear we have of, of just uh, being as good as we can be. You know, we have this, these uh, things that happen to us when we're kids that affect us very strongly. And this isn't the time to go into a whole new lecture, but um, just to say that that is one factor in all of this, everything that we've been discussing as far as making your own personal evolution really count for yourself in this lifetime is also, and the introspection of the Mercury retrograde is also taking a look. And they're still uh, prominent with the Mercury retrograde because the, the, the Mercury uh, Mars midpoint, which th there was a conjunction around the 7th to the 9th of this month, which is the most intense time of it, but they're still I interacting with each other, Mercury and Mars. Mars is moving ahead now, away from Mercury, as you can see in the chart there, at 9 degrees of Leo. But their midpoint is still 5, <laughs> and um, it's interesting, uh, 5 or 6, and it's interesting that um, that's where the, the, uh, the Chiron is in a trine formation. That's where Uranus is in a square formation to that. So I, I think that there are still important factors of, you know, following deep intuition. That would be um, the message of Uranus, that there's a way we can tune into our bodies. There's a way we can tune into our, our chakra centers and where we have inner wounding connected to various parts of our body. And there's uh, the inner wounding itself, which Chiron represents, to recognize where you're being held back. And that's another way to process some of this information that's in such a huge, uh, a huge hit right now. It's like a huge uh, download if we pay attention and we really pay attention to what we're up to and how we can make it through and how it really relates to the bigger picture of where our lives are heading. I think that's what the secret of this time is. So let me transition back to the other. And just to say, um, Best of luck with all that. You know, it's not easy. Um, none of this is easy. You know, I think the society is in a great turmoil right now. Um, and I think individually we're all feeling that. We're not feeling very secure. But um, maybe it is time to take action. You know, climate change is upon us. What are we going to do? We can hide our head in the sand or we can uh, start to take action. And that action will inevitably involve austerity, which is another key word of this Saturn-Pluto time, this conservative empowerment, this time of contraction. Uh, we have to be careful, we have to watch our steps, we have to conserve our resources, and we have to be aware of the resources of the Earth and how those need to be handled in a way that, that are sustainable and we can move on and we can survive this coming period, which is going to be very dire, I think, in the next 10, 20 years. So we need to start acting now to, to really ameliorate that situation. You know, they say um, that uh, the great uh, relief of uh, any, any severe addiction is when uh, you get to the point where you're really bottomed out and you just can't go anywhere but up. You know, you, you may be, um, if, if it's alcohol, you may be a drunk lying in the gutter and saying, uh, God, this has got to change. But the real truth of the matter is that the alcoholic can decide when to bottom out. And I think that's a very significant thought for our times, that we as a, as a culture are addicted to energy, we're addicted to oil, we're addicted to things and materialism, and we can decide, each individual 
amongst us and as a group, as a society, as a whole, we can decide when to bottom out and when to start making a change. And it applies to individual lives as well as to the culture. So I, w <laughs> I wish I had happier news. It's not going to be easy. But we all knew that, didn't we, going into this. So best of luck with everything and keep the faith. Take it the most positive way possible. And have a good transition. Have a good uh, eclipse time. So long. <laughs>